Awesome. Well, happy Thursday, everybody, and welcome to the Data Science Hangout. Hope everyone's having a great week. It was so awesome to get to meet so many of you at the POSIT conference in Chicago, and so happy to be back with everybody this week. Hope you had a great time with Robert last week. Thanks, Robert, for covering for me. I was out of the office and got to go to France last week. Um, but for anybody I haven't had the chance to meet yet, I'm Rachel Dempsey, and I'm the host of our data science hangout here and lead customer marketing at Posit. And so this is our open space to chat about data science leadership, questions you're facing, and really just getting to hear what's going on in the world of data across all different industries. And so we're here every Thursday at the same time, same place. So if, if you're watching this recording on YouTube later, you can also add it to your calendar. If you ever want to join us live, it will be in the details below. And James, I think that's where you first came across the Hangouts as you were watching a lot of them on YouTube too. <laughs> yeah, I've become a bit of a, an, I've become a bit obsessed with programming YouTube. So I, I watch quite a lot of uh, like programming tutorials, programming um, like conference talks online and uh yeah, play YouTube through the through the television. So awesome. um, it's quite Love a it. quite a constant stream for me. Love it. Well, at the the hangout, we're all dedicated to making this a welcoming environment for everybody. So we love hearing from everyone, no matter your years of experience, titles, industry, or the languages that you work in, too. And so it's totally okay for you to just listen in. Maybe you're out for a walk or on, on your lunch break or something, but you can also jump in uh, and ask questions or provide your own perspective on certain topics. So you can raise your hand here on Zoom and I'll keep an eye out. You can put questions in the Zoom chat and just put a little star next to it if it's something that you want me to read out loud. Uh, otherwise, I'll just call on you to introduce yourself and add some context. And then lastly, we also have a Slido link where you can ask questions anonymously too. And our uh, team will share that in the chat in just a second here. But with all that, I am so excited to be joined by my co-host today, James Laird-Smith, data scientist at the Bank of England. And James, I'd love to kick things off by having you introduce yourself and share a little bit about your role, a little bit about the work you do, and also something you like to do outside of work. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be on. So yeah, uh, like you introduced, uh, my name's James. Uh, I uh, am a data scientist at the Bank of England where I kind of work on as like an internal data consultant. So as we'll get onto like the, the bank is quite big. And so I, I partner, uh, the, the team of which I'm part, uh, we partner with different business areas in order to try and um, improve their data science workflows and to, to, to bring kind of a best practice to, to the work that, that they do. I am also sort of separately, um, uh, I have the, a, a kind of a specific title of our business owner, which is uh, something which I, I'm not sure exists in many places. I hadn't heard about it before I joined the bank. But as part of that, I am kind of the, uh, the business's representative uh, of, of, the, of the tool. Uh, which means I, I attend some meetings where some some things about R are, are decided upon, and uh, various. Um, there's also a component of, of of testing, and people can can ask more more about that if they like. Um, but but yeah, so I I play quite a, a key role in in the, at very least the the R language, but probably data science more more broadly at the at the Bank of England. Uh, I, I should also maybe say, uh, because this is a frequent source of uh, misunderstanding. Uh, the, the Bank of England is uh, the UK's central bank. So some people uh, uh, think it's a, it's a retail bank, but it's not. So for those joining from the United States, it's, it's much more akin to the, the Federal Reserve. Um, people who, who are from elsewhere uh, know it as the, the Bank of Australia or the Bank of Japan or the European Central Bank. So uh, we're not a retail bank. We, we're the, um, uh, the, the central bank um, for, the, for the United Kingdom. Yeah, thank you for that clarification too. And, and I'll echo what Lisa said in the chat that it's awesome that you get to represent our the whole organization too. And okay, what about something you like to do outside of work too? Ah, uh, yes, I forgot. Very good, very good. So um, I think uh, there's uh, 
I think for uh, people, what people sometimes will, will notice is uh, about my accent, uh, which is not something I do outside of work. The accent is the same at work and outside of work. But um, it's, uh, uh, I, I happen to be a South African, so I, I only came to the UK about uh, just under six years ago now. Um, and so I have a, perhaps a slightly different perspective as, as somebody who, who learned programming uh, overseas and in, in Africa. And um, that gives me a, a slightly different perspective to, to some people. I think that the thing that people uh, most know me for, though I don't do it that much anymore, is I, I used to be very involved in competitive debating. So at, at high school and at, at university for, for a long time, I, I, de I debated competitively. Um, debating is something which is mainly based out of schools and universities. And so I don't, I don't do it that much anymore, but um, that's, that's something I, I dedicated quite a lot of uh, free time to. Not a lot of data science overlap with, um, with, uh, with competitive debating, but if you ask me about it, I'll, I'll tell you about what, what, what they have in common. It's like, we're going to have to learn a little bit about that. We might just have to start there. <laughs> what, are, what are a few of the things that they have in common or what lessons have you learned from your experience debating? The, the answer is not not much. So like I said before, it, it's a bit of a stretch to say that, that there's um, that there's anything really that much in common. Um, if I if I had a stretch, I would I would say that uh, even uh, even in um, in both roles, a lot of debating is uh, what we call impromptu. So it's um, uh, so we only get a short time to prepare. But that makes us quite good at like brainstorming. So sometimes when I when I do uh, some some modeling, statistical modeling, uh, some of the activity is to uh, to try and imagine what the forces that are in play in your model are. So what's really happening uh, in the real world? And debating has some of that. So when you when you scope out an argument, uh, very often you have to kind of get like hypo hypothetical societies or hypothetical people in your in your in your mind. Um, to to try and um, uh, like understand what's going on. So at a stretch, I think that's probably the similarity. Uh, of course, the the the, the skills on the skills level uh, is very useful to be able to speak in front of people and to have practice speaking in front of people, um, because that that has uh, obviously widespread use, uh, not just in data science but but in lots of professional capacities. Thank you. Something I forgot to say up front, but I wanted to add that in case anybody's joining for the first time, there's always like a party happening in the chat as well and people sharing links and resources with each other. So like perfectly okay and awesome to do that too. So I just like to remind people of that. So if you have resources you wanna share, feel free to use the chat there for that too. Um, but James, when we were talking um, a few weeks ago now, you had mentioned to me that the bank has 4,000 employees and I think like close to a thousand of them use R. And yeah. I was just curious to learn a little bit more of that because that just seems like a huge number of users for the size of the org too. Yeah, so I think the thing to understand is I always think of the Bank of England as just a giant data factory. So like we have a huge amount of data going in and a huge, like a, a broad, uh, a broad set of data going in, um, and of course we produce outputs uh, which which go to uh, which get published and come out in, in various other capacities. Um, so the weird thing is not so much that we have a thousand R users. The thing is we should have more, actually. So it's just that data is just so central to basically every facet of uh, what it what the, the bank does that uh, actually our, our, uh, a lot of our aim is to try and get, get more people into, into R and the data science languages. Um, I have some, uh, I have like a, a brief uh, breakdown, which I kind of prepared for this, which I think is maybe instructive uh, on, on this point. So the bank is hugely varied in the kind of things that it does. So the, the one, there's like one, at least one sort of uh, division of the bank which is a, a bit like an investment bank, like or a, a hedge fund or a mutual fund, um, and their thing is a bit like time series uh, and and the, the usual things you would think of like quantitative um, finance and stuff like that. But then there's another area of the bank which is like uh, an academic department who's pr primarily involved in publishing papers and research, and uh, you know they they will you know, publish in LaTeX um, and and uh, use Quarter and things like that. 
Um, there's also a huge amount of the bank, which is like just operation. So, you know, we, we have operational data. For example, we collect data on like banknotes, right? So, you know, just the, the physical currency, which that's a that's an operational division of the of the bank, but also, you know, collect data and, and we, we, uh, we use that data to make decisions. So my experience is actually that, um, and there's also areas of the bank, which are just like, basically like a tech startup. So, you know, that's just, uh, you know, not untoward, you know, something you might see at like Google or Facebook or something like that. Um, so all of those things just mean that data is uh, ever present in our uh, activities and our, and the work that we do. So um, a lot of our, it's not like we have too many, we, we have too few users, despite the fact that we have sort of, uh, sort of a thousand, something like that. The other thing maybe to, to, to note for people who might, be uh, might not know is we actually have good telemetry on this so we we sort of keep track of uh, the, the number of users of uh, all our different tools uh, and so it's not just like we we count downloads or something like that we actually uh, we we have fairly good um, uh, a fairly good knowledge of exactly who uses what tools and and what they they use them for so it's not an exact science so it's about a, it's about a thousand users over the course of a year um, have 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 used our or, or our studio. Yeah, thank you for that context too. I see a few questions starting to jump in here in the chat. And Alan, I see you had asked a question a bit ago. Do you want to jump in here first? And sorry if my internet just cut out for a second. I think uh is it okay? Does it sound okay now? Yeah. Okay. Um but Alan, I'll I'll start reading it and if you want to jump in after the question was you're the business champ for R. Is there an IT side owner as well? And how do you work together? Yes, absolutely. So, so the idea is that, uh, yeah, we have uh, a technology owner, um, which is yeah, much, much like uh, IT and we have a, a business owner and yes, we do absolutely work together. So the technology owner unsurprisingly is, is often uh, somebody from uh, sort of the uh, sysadmin type of, of role. So, so people are responsible for uh, you know everybody's uh, everybody's tech infrastructure, um, and uh, the uh, the uh, the business owner is does uh, sorry the business owner is designed to be separate from that. So it's designed to be much. It's much more common that this person would be a data scientist. It's much more common that this person you, you know would be working day to day. Um, so it's it's uh, it's a part of my role, but it's not my my entire role. And um, uh, but yeah, we we absolutely work together, and we. Uh, the technology owner and I sort of shoot each other questions every day. Uh, there are areas of overlap, but um, but we kind of uh, need to do different things. The other thing, which the 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 business owner is also meant to be a kind of like champion. So if there's something wrong with the tool, it's you know we we have some some administrators because the, the bank is very big. We have a, a team of administrators. Um, it's my job to to raise issues when they when they come about and to be a kind of sounding board. For um, for the users in general, so or um, well, at least that's how I interpret it. Um, that's um, I, I think the, the 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 common practice. So sometimes have to walk a bit of a tightrope. So um, balancing different different users' interests. Thank you. And, oh, Alan, we can hear you now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, um, Laura. I see you had a question, um, somewhat related as well. Do you want to jump in here? Uh, yeah, so um, it's tagging on to that, and it's related to, you know, when there's two owners of one thing, obviously there's never, just like you said, there's a lot of overlap, and it sounds like you and your IT owner have a good partnership and you work really well together, um, but have you had to weigh the, you know, there's ownership and then there's territorialism, and in every organization I've ever worked at, there are some people who have just moved into the territorialism niche and not, you know, like, oh, that's an IT job, that's not my job kind of situation. Yeah. Oh, that's a data side. That's how do you, besides, it sounds like you have a great relationship with your IT person. I have an awesome relationship with my IT person, but how do you balance that and ensure that you're meeting business needs while not siloing? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great question. Mercifully, I have been been saved from this particular quandary by the, 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 the same way I think you have. Um, a lot of our uh, if, if there are tensions, they tend to come in prioritizing. So where I have to um, uh, uh, judge not like whether something is important because oftentimes when anybody comes to me with something, it's very important for them. Um, uh, so the, 
the, the trade-offs that I have to make and, and pay attention to are what the, the majority of users are likely to find troublesome. And uh, that's, that's often uh, a, a judgment call. Um, uh, and uh, thankfully have never needed to, to escalate that. The bank is very collegial in, in that respect. Um, but uh, if so, then there is a kind of uh, a chain of, of, of command. So there, there is my, my boss and my boss's boss um, who are the official people in charge. So we do have, uh, we do have a chain of command as it were, um, where if a tough decision does need to be made, then, um, uh, then there, there is somebody who, who is, uh, who is in charge of that. Uh, on the on that same note, uh, the 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 metric that I kind of uh, a, a lot of it is individual. The metric I try and use to assess these things, it's important to be mindful of people who don't complain. So people who have like tried to use a tool but have given up because it's it's too difficult, and I have to always be aware that I don't hear from those people because they've given up, and there's kind of a selection bias there, um, which is you know you don't hear from the people who've given up, um, and so. One of the things which we're, uh, I'm, I'm working on right now and will continue to try and work on is, is just getting package installs correct. So we have a, a set of our own internal R packages and um, usually the process is quite streamlined, but of course, if, if there is a, a problem, then that's a very big stumbling block, especially for a new user, but can be for, for an existing user. So things like that, I, I tend to prioritize quite highly um, and I, I will give, I will sort of up weight in terms of their importance. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do and then and requires judgment and experience. I see, um, Mike and Bill, you have two kind of similar questions you were asking around, um, cross government agency groups. Bill, do you want to jump in here? Do you want me to read it? But the question was, um, as part of a government agency, is there a cross governmental agency group, perhaps loosely affiliated? with a focus on R or other languages and perhaps emerging technologies? Uh, we are trying. So, so there, there, there are definitely people who use, uh, uh, who use R across the, the, the government sector. We also have uh, an overlap of uh, em employees. So some employees like leave the government sector or leave some a part of the government sector come to the bank and vice versa. And so uh, we, we have uh, pretty good relationships there. Uh, not quite to to where it could be, and there's the, there's definitely more uh, more uh, sharing that 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 could be done, like and that's uh, that that could also extend to to, to data sharing, um, and there there are some agreements for for data sharing that uh, that exist, but yeah, definitely definitely room to to grow on that one. Mike, did you have any follow up question you want to add there? I know you, your question was similar too. Well, it was more that within pharma industry, we're engaging quite a lot in discussions with the regulatory agencies, you know, FDA being a good example, to define what they want to see from us when we interact with them. Um, I've been talking to one or two people from different parts of finance who've then said, well, it would be fantastic if there was a similar discussion between, you know, various bodies and financial regulators to say, you know, are we giving you what you want? Can we modernize this, you know, and, and have that kind of two way discussion? Yes. So there's there's a couple of avenues on this. And uh, I, there, there, there are um, uh, many lines of communication and a, a lot of them truthfully do not do not cross my path um, because, uh, like I said, like the, the bank being quite broad, um, There'll be different uh, areas of, uh, of, for example, in insurance will be uh, different to, to banking. The one thing we are trying to do uh, quite hard is, is modernize our um, submissions. So what happens, uh, it's probably similar in pharma, uh, you, you will know, but for in the financial services and then uh, finance industry in general, is a, a lot of the time there need to be submissions made to the bank uh, on uh, various uh, aspects of, of regulation. And uh, we put a lot of effort and are still putting a lot of effort on into trying to make that as uh, as seam uh, seamless and streamlined as possible. And that's part of lots of ongoing work. Okay, Travis, on your question, I might need a explanation on the penny scheme from office space from you. <laughs> this is not a serious question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I will say I office space is a great film and I, I, okay. enjoyed, it. I enjoyed it immensely. <laughs> 
I mean, should we? Uh, yeah. So the the premise for those that haven't seen it is um, that it's a group of software engineers, and they they figure out a way to on on top of every transaction of which there are millions per day um take off a fraction of a penny or, or something like that and they become very rich on the scheme and here in the us a lot of us have to start paying back our student loans this month so we're all looking for our own penny scheme so if there's a way to use r to, to help with that um well, let, let's go i i will say something <laughs> i i think i think for those who, who haven't watched office space it's great 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 film um i think just the uh the, the it's, it's amazing how the satirical element of 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 like what it is like to work in an office hasn't really changed since that film was made. So it's it's, it's very good, very good, if somewhat horrifying watching. Uh, it is it is good. Well, thank you, thank you for that explanation, there, <laughs> Travis. Um, Marlene, I see you had a question in the chat too. You want to jump in? Oh sure. Um, hello everyone. And Travis says in the side, I don't know why, but my mind went to the gag. I can't even remember what movie you're it is but um the rotary phone where they keep putting dimes in there and then like you know so incrementally somebody doesn't notice the weight and all of a sudden they take all the dimes out and he just smacks himself with the phone that's where my head went sorry welcome to my brain um hi james thanks for joining us um my question which is kind of general but i i'm always fascinated when i ask um ask folks in the data, data science space this question what is a challenge that maybe you faced and you may still be encountering it, may not have overcome it, but you didn't see it coming. Um, you know, I, I think we all kind of have these like, okay, we're ready to kind of gird our loins for the inevitable, you know, battles between departments and um, governance issues. Um, sometimes it's political, sometimes it's just technical hurdles, but what was something maybe that kind of blindsided you um, in the position that you're in? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think this is uh, this definitely uh, got to me. So I, I spoke before about uh, like just how big the bank is and how much data work goes on. And this had uh, uh, an effect which I wasn't quite prepared for, but my colleagues were very um, uh, good in preparing me for. Uh, it was because uh, part of this this data consulting work that, that we do, um, we, we have a kind of a, a set of practices that we adopt um, which is that we try, we have to like upskill the business area to maintain their own uh, tooling. So that if they develop the process, they have to be responsible for maintaining it. And I came from a, a, a different job where it was like the data scientists would build and maintain the tools. And I'm a, I'm a maintainer at heart. Uh, like I, I maintain like a bunch of our internal R packages. Um, but my my boss had to to have a a serious word with me as he does with like everybody is says, no, 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 we can't maintain it. And that's because if we ever did, uh, we would so quickly become overwhelmed with uh, with with that maintenance burden that, that uh, we wouldn't be able to do anything else. We wouldn't be able to do anything new. Um, uh, and that this was, is, is very symptomatic of just the, the uh, having a very big organization. And I was totally not prepared for this. Um, and so, but 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 I but I wholeheartedly now am, am am on board with that, and I think that just speaks to, you know, you've got to understand your organization, your organization's needs, and it might not be the same. Uh, so yeah, it, it to to be perform you know to to perform well in, in different organizations often means some things. Even sometimes if that means stepping back and saying, you know, actually I, I need to coach somebody through this. I can't just do do it myself. Um, and so that, that, that was a, a, a big one for me. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. There's so much packed into that, by the, by the way, from a project management perspective and yeah. scope creep, right? Because we, yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I could tell you from the handful of people I have interacted with on this call, you guys are a bunch of fixers, right? So we don't like to leave things, um, unhandled or kind of straggling. So we want to fix things. And I think maintenance is a huge part of that. And so kind of drawing clear cut boundaries is something huge for a lot of us. So anyway, thanks for sharing. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. Tyler, I see you had a question in the chat um, a bit earlier. Do you want to jump in here next? 
Yeah, no. Um, thank you, James. I love the insights. Really helpful, especially from the community here. Nice to meet you all. I think one of the things that struck me most with your thousand users, I wouldn't say I'm jealous, um, but we're, you know, as we've we've rolled out Posit and some of the platforms, we're ever in this like struggle to get new users to adopt successfully and happily to a new platform. Um, you know, we love the things we love about Posit. It's a little bit more language agnostic. It's a little bit more open in that sense and, and a little bit more flexible to the communities that we're trying to serve in analytics and data science, right? Um, but I'm just curious, like, how do you guys handle that conversion? Do you mandate training? Do you, how do you support those new users? Um, you know, we're forever trying to, you know, make the Emacs people's happy. Like, uh, you know, how do we, how do we really in that space develop like the kind of like onboarding that can lead to what you have demonstrated as a very successful kind of adoption um, that's a little less top down and like here's a new platform everybody on we're just taking all the old stuff away but more where you can get people to come and really excel and um, grow yeah and the answer the answer is that there are no easy answers so a lot of the things that you've touched on we do have dedicated training and dedicated trainers and we have a, a schedule and uh we we have excellent people in charge of training who who, who forward that on to us uh, documentation also important uh, together with that, you know, the kind of offline asynchronous uh, um, uh, resource that people can 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 consult. I will also say uh, about documentation in general, writing is a delicate art. So uh, I I think one of the things that like makes a difference to me is actually being given time to 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 write something properly, and so to give the user like a beginning to end experience that is like reproducible for them. Uh, that is underrated in my experience. So whenever I, I do sometimes read uh, documentation, sometimes even my own, which is not well written. And it wasn't because, you know, the person writing it is bad. It's just because uh, writing is hard uh, and, and writing in a way that is clear and concise to, to the broadest range of people is an underrated skill that we uh, absolutely should dedicate um, time to. The third pillar of that is just uh, solving common problems as much as possible. So, you know, the the holy grail of um, uh, of package rollouts is, or, you know, um, uh, rollouts as uh, uh, platform rollouts rather is just the one liner. Just can I solve this in one line? Is this like a one line thing that I can put in and I can get the the experience? And we know that, I mean, everybody on this call will know that it's never as easy as that. Um, so if you read like some GitHub readmes and, you know, the, the readme is, you know, two, two pages long and, you know, requires some, some, some Linux dependencies and, um, you know, the, you know, happens to works on my machine syndrome. And as much as you can get away from that uh, is, is, is best. We do that. I, I do that. Uh, I try to do that by just, uh, well, my, my particular solution where I'm, where I'm good at is just to, to build our packages around it. So we have uh, a range of our packages at the bank, which are specifically for data access. So we have you know, X system and this system has a, a way of interacting with that particular data. If it's a database or an API or, um, or something more bespoke, you know, just try and get it one line. I just want, I just want one command that I can, that I can that I can run and, and it gets the user from from zero to to connected um, and as much of, of that as you can as you can you can give to users uh, the better um, yeah never 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 the easiest thing but um, as much as you can do um, you'll reap the benefits. Thank you. I see a big discussion happening in the chat under one of Mike's questions so I'm going to come back to that but. <laughs> Um, there was a Slido question that someone asked anonymously, and it was, how does the bank manage reproducibility of analysis? I guess this kind of touches on what you were just talking about, but especially with the, the thousand users with varying levels of proficiency. Uh, yeah, totally. So I, I think it's, 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 again, some training goes into this. I really think that posits, um, uh, Posit's tool set actually do this incredibly well. So the, the reason that, you know, our markdown doesn't really have, like you can't just like embed, uh, uh, you can't just like reproduce tiny bits of, of our markdown. It, it's really meant to be like start to finish, which basically means, uh, this is a, something I, I didn't realize till, till, till after many years of using it. It's, it's kind of like reproducible by default. And you actually have to opt into the non-reproducible bits. And the same thing with, you know, 
uh, Posit Connect and, and and some others, you know, there's um that that element is uh, uh, is is really good. Um, but otherwise, it's yeah, just uh, the the usual sort of things that people on this call will, will know about, which is you know, try and make examples reproducible. For example, in the the reprex package, uh, a lot about culture and just um, you know running things. But also works in combination with what I just said, which is it's easier if they have easy data connections, right? So uh, if you're able to give some people a data connection package, then they can do it start to finish. And I think a lot of users are actually quite good at they could they. A lot of users, in, in my experience, are quite good at spotting. Oh, now I can run this end to end um, because I've got this this data connection. I'm not working with extracts, um, and I, I I think that yeah, tooling is is a is a big part of that. Thank you, um, Mike. For the question and discussion that's happening in the chat, do you mind jumping in to kind of summarize the the point for me? I was trying to multitask and figure out what it was, and it was too hard. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of exploded. Sorry about that. So um, this is coming back to James's point that um, when you develop stuff, you definitely don't want to own that solution forever, um, or or you know maintain it because then that it's like if you develop an R package and you put it onto CRAN, you are forever the person who's going to have to make, you know, live, live with updating that forever. Um, similarly within the business I'm in, um, we have a, a, a kind of policy that I think is similar to what James was saying, where if we're developing something, it's worth the time to take, to develop it in a way that the people we hand it off to, can can maintain it themselves you know maybe not necessarily expand on it greatly but if if there are bits they they tweak they know where to tweak and they can get in there and you know add a new variable or you know change something from a to b quite readily um i'm trying to get away from Sometimes what I see, which is if you if someone comes to you with a problem, you solve that problem and you get it out the door as fast as possible. And, you know, it is what it is. You just deliver it and say, well, I'm done here. Typically, if you rush at it, then it's harder to, for you and for anyone else to maintain in the long term. So it's a kind of if you take a little bit longer and give them the right solution that's easy to, for everyone to maintain going forward, it's it relieves the burden on everyone. I think that's. <laughs> I, mean, I I can't I can't help but 100% endorse all of that. Um, I, I only have like a, an example to add, which is like I think these these are just these can be straightforward things like function names. So just like take time to name your functions. It's just uh, it's it, it's weird because it feels like like make work, but it's not actually. It's um uh, just you know naming uh, naming functions and, and naming variables and stuff is just a uh, a, a really important part of someone else understanding it in the future and then being able to like audit it or um, or, or debug it in the future. Um, but yeah, 100% endorse. And uh, sorry to, to kind of expand on that. Another example is in um, uh, like markdown documents or reports that you construct for someone. If you make them parameterized and what you do is that you feed in if, if you ingest like a YAML file or something that drives that parameterization then they can always expand it and add future parameters and do all kinds of clever things with it. Um, but it then means that you're not kind of locked into a given structure. Yeah, 100%. I think we stay here for a few more minutes on this topic, given all the the uh, comments there. But uh, Donald, I see you kind of asked a question in that for like, I guess, help in convincing others. Do you want to jump in here? Well, I can read it too. And feel free to jump in after but donald had said in that thread one of the biggest barriers i face in building dashboards or packages is convincing people that the work is worth the maintenance costs from either my team or theirs and would love additional discussions around this or any thoughts you have yeah so um i i everything that i've, I've kind of said also applies to dashboards so dashboard design is just also a hugely underrated skill and uh, takes 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 time and experience to appreciate like what a, when a good when a good dashboard is made well. Um, I uh, uh, yeah I have the the same quandary, which is I I try and say to 
to, to, to managers or, or whomever I'm trying to convince is it's it's much more uh, it's it's much more preferable to have a smaller number of insights conveyed well and continuously than to have a great wedge of of insights to you know com, you know sort of haphazardly um, bandied together. Um, that, that the reason that's not always easy is there's always somebody who wants their favorite chart. Um, and that's that's where you kind of get the uh, dashboard fatigue phenomenon where, you know, everybody wants to put their own like bit on the Christmas tree and eventually the, the, the Christmas tree looks doesn't doesn't look good or falls over. Um, and that's that that's a hard thing. And I think just yeah, manager gumption to say that uh, actually we we don't do this, we aren't going to support like every chart uh we, we're not going to support like the the broadest um range of of, of possible visualizations for this thing we want to focus on, on 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 core insights um and things that the the average person is trying to learn uh or the the average person is going to want to know out of your um your um your output whether it's a dashboard or whether that's something else thank you um a question i had for you is thinking about all the different teams that I've spoken with, probably thousands of teams across six years. Um, how, like, what does your infrastructure look like in terms of like testing and rolling out new products? I know like some teams might have one server, some have 10 servers and they have their own production and staging environment. I was just curious with supporting so many users, what that looked like for you? Yeah, so this is a, a bit of a journey that the bank has been on. So as we sort of like grown in in a, in a user base, we we start to see this a lot more. That you know, when we do roll out a, a new version of R, I'm, I'm kind of now the person responsible for for testing it. But I can't test the code of a thousand users. Uh, for a starter, like not everybody is 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 using version control. Uh, but you know, we we are we are getting there. But yeah, even if they were all using version control, uh, we, we don't always have a, a good catalog of that. And that's part of what I've tried to do is uh, to try and get like a test bank. So do, these are things which absolutely should work. Uh, so uh, these are you know, uh, unit tests and, um, and, and regression tests and integration tests. Um, and uh, our yeah, uh, philosophy is it's, it's a good idea. Um, uh, we try to get business, uh, other areas of the of the bank to, to contribute their code. That's not always easy because they're they're busy as well, um, and uh, it's um, there. There's a couple of blockers to being able to do that. But I will also say that it's uh, again something which just takes time and energy. So you know, I, I invest quite a lot of time in putting together our our, our test suites now, and uh, it's it's hard in the short term, but but pays a lot of dividends in the, in the long term. The other thing which is a bit useful for that is, um, so I my area of focus is kind of on our data warehouse. So not everything in the bank is based around its data warehouse. There are, um, there are parts that are outside that, but the data warehouse is a good, uh, I want to say forum for uh, that kind of testing because it is you know where a lot of things can end up or should end up. And so uh, my sort of like, uh, I, I'm also partly responsible for the, the tooling on the data warehouse. So that's my way of bringing it together. Um, it might be similar for, for those on this on this call. Um, but yeah, just as much as possible, try and get people on board to test it themselves or ask them to contribute it or you know, reach out and, and, and ask their permission to grab it uh, yourself. Um, uh, yeah, certainly worthwhile doing. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I, I just think a lot about the teams who maybe started out with just a few users and are starting to grow and need to expand that infrastructure and how to like know what to do there, what the next steps are. Um, I see like lots of conversation here <laughs> happening in the chat here. I'm trying to pull out the questions. So feel free to just raise your hand here if you have something that wasn't really answered yet. Um, but there's a lot of discussion happening around like dashboard design. I think once we mentioned like dashboard fatigue um, and Eric, I see you had a, a shout out to one of the conference workshops. If you want to jump in here. Yeah, that was um, 
I was privileged to be a TA at David Grangin and Maya Ganz's uh, workshop about effective design principles for shiny dashboards at Posikoff and how highly recommend checking that out as well as David's uh, book on outstanding shiny user interfaces. And with the tooling that now is in shiny itself, in particular with BS Lib, it's becoming a lot easier to incorporate some of these best practices of design without, you know, being an official, you know, UX designer with, you know, years of training. It's, it's something that I think a lot of people are able to pick up on and hopefully avoid some of the dashboard fatigue that can occur. Yeah. I'll say something a, a bit about this. I am constantly struck by just how similar, well, I mean, the, the name does it, does it justice, right? This is design and design is hard. Right. So design is, you know, takes place in all, all facets of life, often underappreciated, uh, easy to ignore, even when it's done right, just like all designers. Um, but I, I kind of feel of the same way about dashboards as I do about good writing. So, you know, good writing starts well, right? You know, the first sentence should like engage the reader in the same way that like the first thing that the, the dashboard uh, shows you should be um, the, the, the most important thing or something not necessarily gripping, but you know something which you you, you would hope would would introduce the the the, the rest of the the the, the concepts which are to to follow. Again, structure is important. I mean, we're very good as humans. I, well, I guess because our our education has focused us on how to structure text very well, because you know we we get uh, lots of lots of training in, on this. Uh, insofar as we have, um, you know, uh, you know, structure headings. Um, citations and things like that. Um, and uh, we don't really get it for dashboards, but uh, a lot of the, uh, the, same, uh, the same things apply, notably some, some exceptions too, but, um, but, uh, but I see them as, as very similar, uh, especially asking yourself the question, or oh, sorry, uh, answering the question on behalf of the user, you know, what, what are you trying to communicate to them? What question do they have that you are trying to answer? And what goes along with that is you don't want to answer trivial questions. You don't, but you also don't want to, you know, answer. Uh, you don't want to lead with a question which is impossibly difficult to understand, and all of that is design. And um, and yeah, we should have design focused um, teaching, which I'm, I'm sure that that workshop that you mentioned, Eric, was was primed to do. Absolutely. And uh, Ted, I feel like there needs to be a shout out to your comment here in the the chat here as well. Um, where Ted said a good dashboard is often the product of subtraction, not addition too. And I see a lot of other thoughts here shared on design. Does anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, I mostly use subtraction because I knew Libby was going to take the bait. So, <laughs> but it, I think it, there is something to be said about, you know, paring things down and editing and people don't really think about that. I'll give people a few more seconds if anybody has anything else they want to add on the design topic. But um, James, I, I think it'd also be interesting to hear a little bit more about the like the organization and how you have like yourself as the R business owner for the business represent representative, and then you have this tech representative. And it just feels like that would be a helpful. I don't know, team to have in many different companies. So I was wondering like, how long has it been that way? Or did your team like, kind of start that or did you have to advocate for that? No, so this this definitely predates me at the bank. So yes, uh, more than a few years now. Um, and I think, well, uh, yeah, just sort of grown out of the uh, of an extending user base. Uh, it's maybe worth mentioning that, uh, you know, we have this for a couple of our tools now, and some of the tools we group together. Um, but, but Python certainly has a, a its own business owner and technology owner, um, and uh, we we have some other internal tools which do that as well. And and arguably we will have some more um, when the, the the community inside the bank grows to to a large enough size. Uh, yeah, I, I mean I I find it uh, you know a, a very healthy construct to 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 have. Uh, with with so many users, and again, you know, I think if you took if you took any of those roles away, you would detract from the quality of service that that the users are able to uh, to to enjoy. Uh, but I, I didn't have it at the the previous place I worked, and um, but um, uh, yeah, if, if people, I'm sure they have been shouting out in the chat. If if not, they um, 
uh, then, uh, but uh, if uh, if not, then yeah, they can shout out now that, uh, yeah, maybe other organizations have it, if maybe not under the same names. I see there's a question in the chat about adopting new tools. I don't know if somebody mm -hmm. wants to shout that out. Um, yeah, I think it was Marlene. Marlene. Yeah, that's yeah. me again. I'm just curious. Like, <laughs> so like how, how amenable or agile is your team specifically about adopting languages, tech, et cetera? Yeah, so I would say that there's a balance, and with uh, with with important work, we we will off, we will facilitate. Um, so what the one thing to bear in mind is the bank is, is quite sensitive about security. So we we have a uh, you know policies on, on what can be installed, um, which I think is fairly common at, at many organizations. And so yeah, we we try and 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 balance the concerns of wanting to adopt new technologies and uh and wanting to, to 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 be secure but also not to um uh to uh adopt something too quickly and the part of the reason is that sometimes uh you know you can get bitten on this so somebody develops a business critical process uh in in a language that's not supported and you know the people will will move on to other roles um, and 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 perhaps leave a bank and you know there's a there's this, a maintenance burden which which goes along with that which we have to be mindful of and yeah those are the the competing concerns and so I I, I think we uh, I I'm on board with the idea that we have to um, uh, we have to to balance things so there there are some there is a, a bit of work happening with Julia right now um, uh, but. Uh, yeah, we we haven't sort of uh, promoted it to to fully fledged support yet, and then, and then we might not. Thank you, um, Libby. I think you have asked a question that was kind of in line with what I was trying to ask earlier, and did I didn't ask it as great as you did. So <laughs> I'd love to have you jump in here sure. too with your question around um, the R Excellence Hub. Yeah. So, um, and I did get an answer, which was great. Um, I've only ever lived the experience of you can't use these packages. You can use these packages and the packages I want to use never being on the list of packages that I can use. Right. So I was always sitting around wondering, is there a land out there where there's like a dev environment where I can just use whatever package I want and create a case for hey, I think we should use this package is, hey, I think we should put this through some testing to make sure that it's safe and then, you know, put it on the list. Um, and it looks like I had one answer saying yes. I'm curious if anybody else has, and, and James, if you have any feedback or experience with it. I, yeah, simply what I've, what I've, what I've said before, we, we, we try and, you know, balance these concerns as, as much as we can. It's such a selfish question <laughs> as, a, as a data end user. I see lots of people like nodding, but I also know that on the regulatory end of it, it's important to not just let people use any package they want and any version they want. And it's, uh, yeah, Mike's like, no. <laughs> so I get it. Um, but that's a tough question, right? How to balance that. I see. Yeah. Um, Mayank, you had shared some thoughts there. Do you want to, do you want to jump in? Uh, thank you, Libby, and thank you for the great session, uh, and James. So uh, we kind of had multiple production servers based on geographies. So we used to work on reinsurance organization and we do data privacy issues in each geography in Europe or Asia. So there would be eight or nine different production servers, but there would be only one uh, dev environment. And nobody would you know really look at dev environment. Uh, uh, there would be oftentimes like a, a data scientist like Libby or myself would want to you know use something out of the room, like say shiny live or whatever stuff. So, not. so they we would ask them to go to dev, you know, play as much as they would want to. And then once you know we will get the sign off, we'll implement those in product. Also, whenever Posit would come up with new updates to you know their products in terms of it, so we would first install on dev. We would have a series of script to do the testing if you know, code-based deployments are working, or am I able to use Gplot and, you know, basic stuff. Once we get a report out of that, you know, we will then move everything to prod, all the updates, and we will do the same regression testing again on that so that you know, we are kind of shielded from you know, immediate updates. And as an organization, we are able to you know, give users the latest and the best. So uh, that's how we use Dev from you know, prod service. So, yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. 
Um, before jumping to another question, James, just want to make sure, did you have anything else you wanted to add there? Uh, no. no. Um, as we get to the close to the top of the hour, just a reminder, if you missed anything in the chat, I'm so sorry. Feel free to just raise your hand as, to ask a question here too, or just copy it over and, and, and ask it again, if that's okay. Um, let me go double check over to Slido as well. Um, but one of the like people oriented questions I love to ask James is about career advice that you've either been given or have given. And so like thinking back, is there a piece of career advice that really like stands out to you? So I would love to, to hear it. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the thing that I, I, it, it's, it's going to sound very obvious, but it's just to, to, to really get enjoyment out of what you do just to, I, I think that that probably speaks to, to a lot of people on the call, given, uh, you know, your attendance here today, but just being interested in, in, in the subject matter that, that your work is involved in is, uh, just huge for your for your motivation and your your ability to continue with it um uh so so that's 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 really excellent uh i but i think uh it's not good career advice perhaps but uh it's always just to to keep perspective about what what your career is and what your job is and that you know you should you should never be um uh, sort of um hamstrung or um or bound to to, to a particular career or company or, or anything like that. Uh, it's just to, 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 to assess as rationally as you can the, the situation you're in and where you want to be um, and uh, to, to, to cash out, to, 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 you know, to, to take time for yourself and to, to make sure you, um, uh, you have that, that, that balance of the considerations that you care about, um, which is not, not very exciting, uh, not, not very novel advice. Um, but, um, uh, I think again, it's going to be super obvious to the people on this call, but, um, if you, if you do get a chance, I do think programming is transformative. So, I mean, I, we are on this call are probably long past the stage where, you know, we, uh, have, we are surprised at the power of programming, but if you, uh, think back to your past selves, uh, certainly back to my past self, uh, which is just the, the, uh, ability to to use code to 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 interact with the various parts of of your life or your work um, uh, was definitely a, a a changing point for me, and so I, I don't mind advising people to to take up code because I know what what code and software um, has done for me, and it happens to be you know re uh, a reasonably good career prospect at the same time. And so, what a fantastic thing for us to be able to to engage in something which is which is both hugely interesting, hugely rewarding, and 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 has good career prospects along along the way. So, not not advice to to anybody watching this, maybe even to, to people watching the stream. But um, you know, if uh, if you are asked to about advice, I, I I think you know, just learning to code is 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 such a phenomenal, um, life changing uh, experience that um, that it's that's worth emphasizing. Thank you for that. Is there a specific story that you'll share with people who you're kind of talking to who are interested in learning, like to show them that impact? Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about my experience of learning. Um, so I learned, uh, I've, I've one of the, uh, so I grew up in South Africa. Um, and one of the things that happens in South Africa, it's changed a lot now. But South, South Africa, internet use as a South African is is far removed from from what you might encounter in the West. So uh, especially with the availability of, of internet data. And so what you'll get is uh, it's changed quite a lot now, but South Africans used to like turn off the data on their phone because they were afraid of being charged on their, on their mobile plan because they, you know, uh, internet was, was, was very expensive. And so, um, uh, or it, it used to be very expensive. And so what I would do is I would go to the, the university library and I would, find a way to download YouTube videos. So I would, I, I listened to, to, to some talks on, 
on Python and, and, and oh, this was important for my studying, but I, I downloaded them because I knew it would be too expensive to, to watch them all um, in, my, um, uh, in, in my flat at home, uh, even though I'm, you know, by, by South African standards, very, very well off. Um, but, you know, just it wasn't worth it from, from that perspective. Um, and so, you know, these, these demonstrations, which were, were video recorded, were just like gold dust to me. They were like, you know, something which I, as somebody who lived many, many thousands of, well, you know, thousands of kilometers away, uh, could, could experience this, this world. And I got insight into this world and, and live demonstrations. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, changed my life. And um, uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, that, that's a story that I'll, I'll tell, you know, having to, to download those those YouTube videos. And I, uh, of course you watch them on repeat because you could never download enough. So I ended up watching them uh, uh, quite a lot. Um, now, of course, I, I have a, a, a much better experience of, of watching of watching YouTube. But um, I, I would also say that that kind of reinforces the notion of uh, of, of video. So I know that you know some conferences and, and some speakers on Stanley don't don't want to be video, but it is it is so so appreciated by people who who cannot be in the room with you. Um, and there are there are kids in in other parts of the world who will watch that, who will go out of their way to watch that, and. Um, and you're always uh, speaking to them. Absolutely. I love that. Thank, thank you so much for sharing that, James. My pleasure. I, uh, thank you for having me. I know we have uh, two minutes left here. And I realized, Eric, I had missed one of your questions from earlier. If you want to jump in here with one of the, the last questions. Yeah, I mean, certainly, James, you don't have to answer all this fully in the time we have. But just curious from your standpoint of all the data you mentioned that you're dealing with at the bank, are there uses of R with other novel technologies that are enabling a lot more, you know, speed or performance for your, your data science teams as you're crunching through this vast amount of data? So yeah, in the, in the middle section, there's definitely data table. So data table is great. Uh, data table, uh, you know, um, uh, slightly uh, yeah, uh, underrated uh, R technology, but uh, when you have uh, something which, uh, a lot of people try to take out of the database uh, and and want to work on 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 really big data, but they need the performance. Also, lots of people like data table for for its syntax. So um, so that's uh, that's great. Um, a lot of the things. So I guess we are now um, just starting on this journey, like anybody of of LLMs, and so we have a, a hackathon quite soon just to see the. Uh, we're, we're not using it in in, in earnest yet. Uh, there's just a, a couple of um, things that are that are being planned, and we'll, we'll see what comes out of that. Of course, we do do text mining. So text mining, uh, the bank has a, a network of agents across the country, and those agents report to us on they they do interviews and they report to us on the state of of different um, uh, industries and 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 businesses, and so text mining is very very fruitful for for be able to to extract insights from that. Um, so uh, yeah, like I said before, it, it's it's hugely varied. Um, uh, so the bank is very data set hungry, and, um, and those are just some of uh, some of the ways that we that we utilize R in particular. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much, James, for for joining us today and and sharing your perspective. I, it's a reminder to me too, to also say thank you to everybody who ends up watching these hangouts on YouTube in the future as well. I just want to say like, you all are part of this community as well. Even if you're not here with us in the room, maybe you're watching on YouTube and commenting and sharing with others as well. Um, but a special thank you as well to everybody here for all the great questions today. I am. Um, I had so much fun getting to meet so many of you at the conference and also just wanted to say like amazing job on all of the conference talks. It was so fun just like running around to try and like catch as many of the data science hangout folks talks um, or whether you were watching those virtually or there in person in Chicago. So thanks everybody for making this community what it is and hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.